Welcome back to my channel. My name is Andrea and in today's video I would like to share with you a day in the life of a rare book librarian. Now this is a video I've been mentally working on for maybe a year because I wanted to give myself that year to, to get a sense of the day-to-day. -day. I will have to give a few disclaimers before I begin. First, it's okay that I filmed. I have gotten permission to do this. Uh, a lot of rare libraries don't allow for filming or for publication of that footage on private vlogs or vlogs. The second thing is that not every library is like mine or the way we are. So we're a very small rare book library. Because of that, a lot of my role, which for the last year I've been the only librarian present, has been to do a lot of little tasks in smaller capacities, whereas larger rare book libraries will have very specialized PhD people in there who are you know, working on a specialized field, like only medieval manuscripts, only one category of the rare book library. And the last thing I'll mention is that we're also kind of a private library in a private college, which is currently in the process of opening up its gates to the public. So in that sense, my job has been to kind of know the history and the historical aspects and like slowly open things up or make things more accessible. Now that out of the way, I will say that my day begins like everybody else's. I have to get up, get ready, get on the subway and commute to work. My commute is very short, which has made my reading life suffer a little bit. Once I get to work, I usually do one of two things. The first is either go straight to the stacks and turn on the lights, um, maybe take a look around, make sure everything's okay, pick out one book and figure out that that's gonna be my project for the day. The second thing, which is the more common thing, is that I check my email because emails are my reference work in, in a way. Unlike a public library where you would get different patrons walk by and just ask you random questions, I get very specific questions emailed to me on a daily basis and this usually takes me around an hour or two to answer. Sometimes they are research questions about a specific topic, in which case I need to collect all of the information we have and schedule in an appointment for later in that week for the person to come in and actually take a look themselves. Sometimes people ask me to scan certain materials for a book that they're publishing, and we happen to have the only book that has an illustration about it. All of the reference questions differ and it's not kind of like a set in stone thing. But these reference questions make up a big bulk of what I do that's kind of different from anyone else in the college. And a lot of people sometimes ask to see the, the bibliography printing room and the collection of books on one-on-one. -on -one. And sometimes I just have to organize these um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes it's more impromptu. Sometimes someone emails me the day before. It all depends. Aside from this reference work, which can be very unpredictable, my job would kind of be split up into five categories. So the first would be the books, the books themselves, everything about the books. And I'll get into every section in a minute. The second is the students. Um, I do try to focus on students a lot. Public outreach, which is huge. Um, it's a big part of this shift that I told you about uh, from private to public. Then I have special projects and I'll give you two examples of the two I'm currently working on. And of course the last one is continuous learning. The last kind of subcategory that's not really part of the big five is taking on tasks that are outside of my job role, which I have done many times and I just believe in helping other people if you can and if you have the time and I don't see this as a problem. Uh, especially if it's needed and it would benefit the entire college because we're kind of like symbiotic that way. So it really helps to have different departments working together in many ways. So um, I sometimes take on little things that are kind of outside the rare book librarianship scope. All right, so the books. This is the first and best category because it's a rare book library and that's the main focus. Now there are rules when it comes to rare books. There are rules on how to handle rare books. Each library has its own rules. The main rule is that only the rare book librarians get to touch the books and you get to handle them and decide who gets to look at them, when, how. So you're kind of a guardian of the books in many ways, which is why I'm kind of a filter there between the emails and the books and 
um, kind of acting as an in-between. Once in a while, we will get a significant donation from someone who has been pre-approved and we've already discussed what they will be donating. And at first, this will require me to take note of all of the books, and sometimes it can be like 500 volumes, and this can take a while. Just typing in the basic information in an Excel document can take weeks, uh, because you're trying to take note of what's important, where to put it, um, and just get a sense of them. Like, this isn't even cataloging yet. And then from there, you would have to get them appraised because you want to know their worth, their value, their authenticity, um, and their role in the library. And it also helps for further down the line for the library to have a sense of its acquisitions and its history and patronage and where we got something, how much it was worth at the time. Um, it's a very important part of a, a library's collection history. And this is followed by the long and slow process of cataloging. And rare book cataloging takes 10 times longer than normal recent publication cataloging. So unlike the contemporary books, rare books cataloging requires collation formulas, descriptive bibliography, a lot of description that's item specific, as if it's a unique artifact, which it is, rather than information that would apply to all of the books that have been published as this book, um, which is usually used in a public library or a regular academic library, because you're working with unique items, so it's an item by item cataloging. I have three books that I reference a lot while I'm working on this, but it's a very long and slow process. And unfortunately, because I have so many other things to do, this is something that has taken a bit of a backseat, uh, but it's something that absolutely needs to be done in a library and it takes a really long time. <laughs> then of course, there's taking books off the shelf for people, putting them back. Um, going to the stacks isn't the same as just browsing a normal library. You have to take account of what you've taken, where you've taken it from. Take note, you always wanna keep track of everything. And like I've mentioned before, because people's individual requests are so different, this also dictates the ways that I interact with the books every day because they could also be different. What I'm required to do with a book today might not be the same thing tomorrow. And the last thing that I want to mention about the books is that once a week um, we have a book binder who comes in and he's a person that I admire so much. Um, every single time he comes in I kind of pull up a chair or just start talking to him and I really like to observe what he does um, he's taught me a lot about book restoration and every kind of week I try to pull out a few books for him to work on that week. Um, things that have been damaged by time. He will assess the books and repair them a lot of the times with Japanese paper because it's very durable. But he also focuses on making things reversible and thinking ahead to future book repair. He hopes that future repair work will look at his work and be able to either undo it or fix it or reverse it back to its original condition in some way without it being unalterable. And that in itself is an art. And I just, I've made a whole video where I interviewed him for my work channel and it's just phenomenal to watch him work. But I really got more involved and more interested in book repair or book restoration since starting here trying, and trying as much to learn from an expert. Okay, so category two is the students and this is very important to me. As a student I felt like there was a missing bridge between the working professional life and us in school and as a librarian now I'm trying to either make that bridge a bit stronger or just allow more people on it if you know what I mean. So I tried to create projects for students who are currently in library school or students who are within our college who want to take on a project. And I try to create things that are accessible, but at the same time have a like huge learning curve. And this way I do a lot of supervisory work and um, get to watch them create, which is beautiful. And so far, no one has disappointed me even a little bit. Um, they come up with the coolest exhibits. Um, exhibit work usually crosses over between librarianship art history, book history, so a lot of students from different departments can access this project and 
for that, I've been just very grateful to be able to help other people to add one more thing to their professional resume and at the same time have some experience with rare books, which you wouldn't otherwise get. Providing feedback is also a big component and kind of guiding them. In my case, for the last year, I also had a different um, job description that involved coordinating a rare books program for students and that was an entirely different kind of communication that was also done through email but um, kind of contacting students in a different capacity which I'm no longer doing so now I can focus more on the library section and the last component when it comes to students is of course tours um, as I mentioned before I give them one-on-one -on -one usually but there will be occasionally an opportunity to have a whole class or a whole workshop or a whole group where I will showcase some of the books that we have. And I try to pick different things like a Mesopotamian tablet, some medieval manuscripts, some Victorian books. This way they get an array of books from a long period and they get to see the differences. Um, it's really fun talking to people because you also get the opportunity to see what others find interesting, which I might have gotten used to by now or I'd never thought of. And that's always a lot of fun. So I really, really enjoy working with students. This brings us to the next section, which is public outreach. Public outreach is very important. How does anyone know that we have certain things in our collections unless they're exposed to it in some way? Either they find out from a friend or a flyer or some video or Instagram or something. So public outreach for me has been very important here. And the first thing I did, which most of you who have followed me for a while know, is that I started a YouTube channel for that library. And at the beginning, it was just me kind of trying to take a look at one book a week and learn as much as I can about it. And sometimes I had no information to go on, so I would just try to piece it together. Um, and then over time, I really wanted to open this up to students as well and invite more people who have just one specific expertise, you know, and they've worked on a project and they'd like to share that. So I really want to make that YouTube channel be more collaborative than usual. Uh, I want it to be different from this one, which is just about me. And it's been interesting watching people kind of get used to the camera or um, the things that make some people shy. And I remember feeling those feelings at the very beginning of this channel um, and kind of talking people through that and, and guiding them or trying to make it interview style so that they feel like they're talking to me. Uh, this also takes up a lot of time, you know, working on YouTube videos, working on Instagram, uh, everything. And, and sometimes this can involve like a tour or a workshop and we have an entirely different section of the library called the bibliography room, which has printing presses and type. And I have a coworker who is always doing public outreach there and taking on students to actually use this equipment. And that is just a whole different department. And it's fun to watch people at work and they're so enthusiastic. Um, but yeah, public outreach has been a big part. And of course, this can include creating, you know, brochures, pamphlets about the library, digitization of rare audio that has to do with college history. People do ask me a lot of questions about the college's history, so um, I do have to brush up on that a lot. And it's important. Uh, public outreach is so important because this is the part where my personal work connects and clicks with the community that it's supposed to be serving. It's me kind of sharing this with them, but also them being kind of offered an open invitation to to come in cannot tell you how many times people have said to me i wish i knew this was here i had no idea you had this i didn't even know this existed um and that is the big problem with a lot of libraries not just ours public private academic libraries they all have this issue where the general public is never introduced to what they have. I strongly believe that public outreach will be a much bigger role in libraries going forward, especially in a world with an abundance of information. Next section is special projects. So these are things that I take on on my own in the background in my office that I'm working on as a librarian. So I try to do projects uh, sometimes this can involve, you know, publications, it can involve speaking at conferences, it can involve speaking to another group somewhere else. Librarians have a sort of professional life that 
resembles a lot of what professors do as well, but in a different field. But it's still a lot of the same activities. I'll give you an example of two projects that I'm working on right now. And they're both very different. So the first one is uh, that we have a lot of manuscript fragments. Fragment is when a page has been ripped out or a leaf from a manuscript codex and people tried to sell them separately for more money in the past. And now a lot of librarians and archivists are finding uh, loose leaves of medieval manuscripts and some of them have been used as waste paper some of them have just been sold at art auctions and so on so that people were trying to make more money off of a book and now there's a digitization project that's happening in Switzerland it's called the Fragmentorium and they collect manuscripts from all over the world and when I say manuscripts I mean manuscript fragments and as librarians you kind of try to catalog that page or that leaf as detailed as you can. You measure it, you see what you can identify about it. So this project involves, you know, digitization, using professional equipment, uh, cataloging, and keeping in touch and in communication with people because some of the individual manuscript leaves are from completely different manuscripts. So some of them might be in Greek, some of them might be in Latin. Uh, so you're dealing with a lot of differences and specializations that are just outside of my field. It requires a lot of reaching out to people for information. Please know that when I do finish this project, I will definitely be sharing it on Twitter. I'll probably share it in the community page here. Um, I want as many people to see these things as possible. The whole process is basically um, an attempt to reach a more accessible platform. Digitally, of course, because, you know, you want people to reach it from around the world. I do want to show you an example of a book where the printed book itself uses manuscript as waste paper. They didn't want to waste it and, you know, if if it was going to go in the garbage or be burned, they would rather use it as special padding for the book. So in this scenario, it's used both at the front and the back to support the book that is itself printed by printing press. So this is just an example of a fragment out in the wild without it having been ripped or individually archived. Um, the second project involves a lot of incunables. I found many incunable leaves in our collection that have not been accounted for. And incunables are baby books. Um, they are the babies. They're not for babies. Uh, these are books that were printed between 1450 and 1501 and these are the earliest printed works via printing press. Um, if you haven't figured it by now, our collection really focuses on printing history and things to do with the printing press. That's why we have so many printing presses in the bibliography room. Working with these incunables is also a different digitization project and my goal here is to let students know that we have them so that they can come and do research on them or work with them and this could potentially start many exciting projects. So these are just two examples of, you know, projects I'm working on that are kind of, you know, on my own in between all those other tasks that I've discussed earlier. And I've recently gotten a library assistant who is a fellow librarian and she is wonderful. Um, and right now I'm working a lot on kind of training but also learning from her because she's taught me a lot of the things that I just talked about. So it's it's been a really fun adventure just kind of uh, meeting new people in all of these different projects. And of course the last thing which is continuous learning. This is very important for any librarian in any library or field. Um, when I first got to this college I read an entire book on the history of just this college. I wanted to know the history of the archives in the library. I wanted to know everything there was to know. Um, as I use every book in a YouTube video, I have to do research on every single topic and this will take me hours or days. Sometimes I take courses on the side, sometimes during work, but not really. Um, I try to do this a little bit on my own time, but um, occasionally there will be a seminar or a workshop offered by a different library around a specific manuscript or a specific kind of collection. And this is just a form of professional development um, and how it looks like for rare book librarians. And of course, as I've mentioned, librarian presence requires to go talk to other librarians, go to conferences, present, publish. All of this takes time. And, you know, sometimes you gotta squeeze it in there somewhere. 
If you want more information on what makes a book rare or what I've taken in library school that brought me here or my personal collection of rare books, I have made videos on those three topics. I will also link down below the work uh, YouTube channel which showcases a different rare book or a different rare book project um, and if you want to check it out, it's there. It's something I'll be continuing to work on. And even if I'm not in the video, I am behind the camera. So that's kind of like a big project of mine that I love. <laughs> and I'm hoping more people contribute to it in the future. So that's it. That's kind of my working life in a nutshell at the moment. I really wanted to document this for myself, but also to share it with other people. And if you have more questions or things that you think I should have addressed but didn't or things you're wondering about, do let me know in the comment section below. Thank you all very much for watching and I will see you in my next YouTube video. Bye!